No plans to stop vending at the Cheapside Market. Government prepares to hand over steel-framed houses to Barbadians displaced by Hurricane Elsa. The police investigating a robbery at a supermarket in St. George. And in sports, Celtics force Game 3 as they give Highlands just their second defeat of the BABA season. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC Newsnight, starting now. Good evening, I'm Pearson Bowie. Minister of Agriculture Indar Ware is making it clear tonight his ministry has made no decision to remove vendors from the Cheapside Market or anywhere in Bridgetown. His statement follows media reports of concerns raised by some Cheapside vendors regarding rumors of them being displaced. Crystal Hoyt has that story. Minister Ware says there is no truth to rumors of vendors being removed from the Cheapside Market. I want to say on record that my ministry certainly not be a minister have made any decision to move any vendors from anywhere in Richtham. I do not support this whole notion of treating vendors as if they are not business people. Vendors are business people that deserve to be treated as such. I have issued no directive for vendors to be moved for any reason at all. Give the vendors my calm assurance that they will remain where they are. Alistair Alexander, president of the Barbados Association of Retailers, Vendors and Entrepreneurs, Barvin, has also dismissed the notion that vendors are being ejected from the site. First of all, I can tell you that the Prime Minister does not operate so with vendors. And um, I spoke to the manager of markets and I was assured that no such word was given to the vendors. Barvin already said that it has to be uh, a cleanup and organized, and it has nothing to, had nothing to do with World Cup. But understanding that that the world will be here for the World Cup, we are talking about a development. This is not a destruction of vending in this area. What plans there are is to 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 make here very aesthetically pleasing to the eyes, to locals and to visitors. However, cheap side vendor Princess Belgrave is not impressed by talk of plans of development. Redevelop? Well, then they're redeveloping something. Why they may come to me a farm and a meeting? Why they may tell me this? All out here, shall it be one big festival going to Kensington Oval with people frying fish cakes and the men out in Temple Yard coming out here with a little art and craft. These are the things that the people come to Barbados to see. They want roast bread fruit, they want sugar cane, they want a sugar apple, they want golden apple, they want mango. These are the things the country people come to see. You think they come to see Rome and Italy? They come to see Barbados at the finest. According to Mr. Alexander, the redevelopment plans include upgrading to structures of the highest standard. Crystal Hoyt, CBC News. Well, earlier we were told about changes coming to the Temple Yard as part of reported efforts to revitalize markets in the city. Speaking on behalf of the Planning Committee, Acting Director of Public Affairs Department Crystal Austin revealed the official reconstruction effort is soon to get underway. Temple Yard is the unique local art Rastafarian craft and food market popular for its leather craft and food wooden structures. Temple Yard historically has been a hub of cultural, culinary and artistic expression for the Rastafarian community in Bridgetown and like many areas of the capital is in need of a facelift. The planning team is engaging actively with the vendors and the wider Rastafarian community who are the ultimate beneficiaries to develop and execute the new design. We're looking at how do we preserve the legacy of this iconic space while advancing the economic and socio-cultural well-being of this important community. This will mean incorporating events, proper lighting and security. We are also working on new standards for tenants who will be given business development guidance and support throughout the transition period so that the new space can welcome both locals and visitors to the island. Scores of Barbadians who lost their homes to Hurricane Elsa in 2021 will soon have keys to the properties financed by government. Officials say the steel frame houses, scheduled to have been completed a few years ago, are built to resist Category 3 hurricane force winds. Sean Farrell reports. 
government has completed 61 of the 150 steel frame houses built to accommodate Barbadians displaced by Hurricane Elsa. Minister of Housing Dwight Sutherland says the remaining 89 houses will be completed by East West Solutions Barbados Inc. within the next financial year. Mr. Sutherland says the steel housing project, which is costing government more than $50 million, has faced a number of challenges and delays. Firstly, disruption of the international supply chains due to COVID-19 pandemic, which caused shipping delays and resulted in the late arrival of the houses by approximately two months. Number two, increase in freight costs due to oil prices and war, and I mentioned that earlier. Three, the unavailability and dramatic cost increase of containers for global shipping. As a result, the project was affected by a four times increase in the price of shipping containers from $5,000 per container to $20,000 per container. Yet another externality. Four, legal issues surrounding the rights to the lands occupied by a significant number of Hurricane Elsa clients, which resulted in considerable delays or the abandonment of some locations as project sites. The minister's announcement comes on the heels of concerns raised in the Barbados Audit Office report on the acquisition and construction of steel frame housing units by the Ministry of Housing, Lands and Maintenance. The Auditor General has highlighted that the project faces millions in cost overruns. Questions about the project were also asked by opposition leader Ralph Thorne. Mr. Sutherland, however, has reiterated government's intention is to provide housing for Barbadians. The project, like I said, some of the challenges and some of the costs we overruns, while we can sit in hindsight, it's 2020, yes, and we accept that some of these things should have been factored in, like the cost of when we decide to change from providing these houses for Hurricane Elsa victims, we then had to utilize state lands. And that was the fastest process to get these houses up. Picture us not utilizing state lands and then we have to go through the land acquisition process. How long would that take, Nikki? Going through the land acquisition At process. At least another three months. At least another three months to acquire the land, then to have the land vested probably in NHC. Mr. Sutherland notes Barbados now has approximately 80 to 90 individuals skilled in assembling and installing steel frame houses. Sean Farrell, CBC News. Four suspects have been detained by police following a brazen daylight robbery at Fair Deals supermarket at Ellerton, St. George. Reports also indicate a firearm and an undisclosed sum of money have been recovered. Videos circulating on social media show two men dressed in hoodies, one in black and the other in white, exiting a vehicle and entering the supermarket. They went straight to the cashier with one of the men brandishing a weapon and the ordering of the staff member to open the cash register before emptying it. The bandits then returned to the vehicle and fled the scene. Speaking to CBC Today, proprietor Juanita Hewitt, who declined to speak on camera, says she's angry. But she's also thinking about her next move following the robbery. Here you are trying to work honestly, trying to be a good citizen, and then people sitting down and plotting how to take you out, more or less. And it was, I was angry, still angry but not as bad, not as much as I was before because I have been praying all morning and all night to get this anger out of me. So it is slowly going, you know, but it's not a nice feeling. Ms. Hewitt says this is not the first time the establishment has been robbed as it was hit four times during the COVID-19 lockdowns. Hewitt says she was not there when the brazen robbery occurred, which left staff and customers traumatized, resulting in staff being unable to attend work today. However, she says that today was the unusual busy day and despite the robbery, she felt a sense of duty to open her doors. I must say I have great customers. The people in the community are very welcoming and a lot of them came this morning and they were expressing their anger 
and they're shocked at what happened because we also had customers in here too. And they made the customers lay down and, and, and strip them. Well, when I say strip, not off the clothes, but from what their belongings, you know. So it was not, it was not a good feeling. As Barbados tackles the effects of dry weather conditions, one local business is being proactive in tackling water scarcity on the island. In doing so, it has won an international award and brought recognition to Barbados for outstanding sustainability practices. Stacey Russell tells us more. Water in Barbados is scarce, and when one's business is keeping land looking its pristine best and relies heavily on using large amounts of water, implementing sustainable practices becomes high priority. This is certainly the case with golf club resort Apes Hill Barbados. It copped the world's best eco-friendly golf facility award at the recent golf awards in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. One of its prime environmentally friendly features, a reservoir harvesting some 360 million gallons of rainwater per annum that irrigates the course and surrounding areas, captured the attention of the voters. This took close to two years to build. Okay. Um, obviously, this was built in the first construction stage with the, when we opened up the golf course 17, 18 years ago in the original days. Um, you know, the, uh, the whole idea and the concept of this was, was foreseen with Sir Charles Williams. Uh, rest in peace, you know, it's, been, it's an incredible feat what they achieved here, you know, catching natural rainwater, you know, to, to grow what we're doing there. Besides watering the grounds without relying on the Barbados Water Authority, Apes Hill Barbados is growing edible plants, keeping bees. We've got 27 beehives right now, that will move up to 100, so we're getting our team educated in beekeeping. Um, it's ongoing in all these areas, you know, um, recycling, all of that's ongoing. Um, so, it's, you know, we have close to 85 people just maintaining the golf course. And encouraging the reproduction of wildlife and breeding of fish on its 475-acre property. This is one of about seven new water features we've put on the golf course since we've rebuilt it. Okay. Um, this one here is very special that we have different depths of water. Um, up the top side is like six inches deep, some areas is five foot deep, which is really good for the migratory birds. Its management is keen on partnering with local farmers as it looks to take on organic poultry and livestock farming in the near future. We want to develop organic farming and we started with our fruits, our vegetables, our herbs. But how do we then, you know, transfer that knowledge to others? Other than being the world's best eco-friendly golf facility, Apes Hill Barbados bagged three other titles at the 10th World Golf Awards. World's best golf real estate venue, the Caribbean's best golf course and best golf course in Barbados. Four flushes for Barbados. Stacy Russell, CBC News. Education officials are considering all options in relation to environmental issues at the Les Devon School before a final decision is made. This has been disclosed by Chief Education Officer Dr. Ramona Archer Bradshaw following a closed door meeting between education officials, health officials and parents at Queen's College this afternoon. The next step would be for me to meet with the technical team at the Ministry of Education, analyze all the input from the teachers and other members of staff, as well as the parents, and make a decision with regard to the Leicester Ford School. As soon as we make that decision, we'll communicate with all parties, the unions, the teachers, the principal, chairman, the board of management, and most importantly, the parents. Well, that meeting follows months of frustration by parents and staff complaining about foul orders resulting in sick staff and students and classes being moved to online for the last few weeks of the Hillary term, which ended yesterday. Now, the Caribbean Court of Justice Academy for Law has honored four outstanding jurists for their service and contributions to the legal profession. 
Chief Justice Sir Patterson Cheltenham, former President of the Senate Sir Richard Cheltenham, former Attorney General Sir Henry Ford, and former Chief Justice Sir David Simmons were presented with tokens of appreciation during a ceremony at the Judges' Lounge of the Supreme Court yesterday. The distinguished legal practitioners were presented with a special pin. Judge of the CCJ, Justice Winston Anderson, also presented the honorees with copies of the legendary Caribbean Legal Practitioners book, which is the third installment of the Academy's eminent Caribbean Juris series. Chief Justice Cheltenham says his fellow honorees are skilled exponents of their craft. The tragedy is that these highly distinguished and skilled practitioners, very few members of the bar, nor of them, have ever seen them in action. And the other strange and ironic situa situation we have is that with such a high emphasis now on oral advocacy or the written advocacy, the oral side is seem to be diminishing. There's always room for people to speak well in court, but I think more and more as we bring the commercial elements into how we manage litigation, or you have 20 minutes or 30 minutes, almost akin to what they do in the United States Supreme Court, but part of it is simply because of the demands on the court, the pressure, the unrelenting numbers which we have. And you have to find techniques, some not always palatable, in order to get the matters through the system. Sir Richard Cheltenham says the award has forced him to reflect on his legal and political career. To me, they are both about serving people and helping people. And though I have had the benefit of working for many well-to-do and big claims, it was my extraordinary privilege to work for the average man. I felt tremendous satisfaction in my criminal law practice and my personal injury practice in particular. Those cases meant the world to those claims and it was my pleasure to help them even when they could not pay. Sir David Simmons says he and his colleagues are recipients of the awards because of their dedication to the law. He says the legal fraternity has lost several members this year and they too should be remembered for their contribution to the development of the profession. I chair the Judicial Appointments Committee of Barbados and had the pleasure again of recommending that Jeff Kamabash be appointed to the Court of Appeal. We lost Jeff this year. And when I served as a member of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission of the Cayman Islands, it was my fortune to interview and appoint Dennis Morrison. See Dennis Morrison of Jamaica. He is gone too. So it's a passing parade. It has to happen to all of us. And uh, I have to prepare myself for it. Nevertheless, I'm sorry to end on that note, but I think that we need to recognize that they, those who have gone. A five-day film writing boot camp sponsored by the National Cultural Foundation could give local practitioners a chance for their short films to reach international audiences. The boot camp, which ends on April the 7th, is being conducted by international film producers and writers and give them a chance to access $50,000 towards developing their short films. They're working with producer Whitney Payne, an award-winning producer who has done several television series, Tamara Ehi, a screenwriter, producer and presenter and actor, and filmmaker Femi Oyen Iran. Participants were addressed by NCF's Senior Business Development Officer, Andre Hoyt, about the boot camp's purpose. Our connection is not about necessarily um, going outside of who we are, but we thought about how we can grow the self-to-self -self, um, partnership. Uh, of course, we're going to Africa where we have a lot of connections, and hence um, that is where we started. And um, so the, the program is essentially based on taking the writers who are here today on journeys so they can start to open up their minds. And then these two facilitators will help them to shape those stories. Mr. Hoyt also spoke about the pitch day, which would lead to the final story selection for film production. 
We will then pitch those shorts to um, some interesting uh, players in the industry to see how we can make them into major movies or into television series. And um, specifically why we selected um, Tamara and Femi because of their experience um, in film and television. That was very important to us. And um, helping us to also see how we can make our shorts a little more um, global. Children in Need are again the focus of the Shafet Fun Run. Slated for May the 19th, it provides Shafet and the co-sponsors the opportunity to continue the legacy of the late Dame Olga Lope Seal, the creator of the Needy Children's Fund. At the launching of this year's event, Jerry Lewis, general manager of Radisson Aquatica, one of the co-sponsors of the event, told the gathering that it provides for the needs of those who are less fortunate. Because its purpose seeks to address the needs of those children who are less fortunate. By doing what? You heard the theme. By uplifting them, uplifting their potential, uplifting their self-esteem, confidence, and life outlook, uplifting their lives. Managing Director of Shafet Restaurants, Ryan Halut, says the company is pleased to continue with the work. He says the company's philosophy is to give back. To see those kids and, and they have their shoes on and they, and they can perform is, is amazing to do that. You provide them with the tools and most of the time things will turn out positive. Yeah, the road is not going to be straight and there will be challenges, but all that's part of learning and growing. And to be able to provide the basics, like Jerry said, food, you know, I mean, like my stomach is growling, I don't really eat that much for breakfast, but I ate something. Can you imagine not eating? And I don't know what time it is now, I don't want to watch, but midday, 12, 1, 2 o'clock, and you're not eating, and you have to perform in school, the sun is hot. I mean, every year it's getting hotter and hotter. Just to have a meal that we all take for granted, and it makes sense that it would affect your, your behavior, your performance in school, etc., your attitude. Sports Night is brought to you by Power In. Pause is power. And by Dasani. Live first, Dasani after. And as promised, it's time for Friday Night Sports with Mark Seal. Mark, good evening. Very good evening. We're going to start with netball, where defending champions Barbados Baby Gems have a 2 0 record at the Jean Pierre Caribbean Youth Championship in St. Lucia. The Belgian girls won their second match last night, defeating St. Vincent and the Grenadines 22-13. Goal attack Tyra Griffith made 10 of 10 for a perfect shooting night, while the other goal attack, Taisha Trotman, had 8 of 11, and goal shooter Kiana Hart, 4 of 13. We have some highlights. It's Team Barbados. They have the ball. The goal attack will be taking the ball. As the center tries to find the goal shooter, contact on the goal goalkeeper, penalty shot or pass, the goal attack will be taking that shot. And we have our first goal. The goal attack makes another attempt. And we have the first goal on the board for Team St. Vincent. The score is now one to St. Vincent and three to Team Barbados. The goalkeeper makes an easy pass to the goal defender. Goal defender gets it to the win attack. The win attack gets it to the center. And the center makes a pass to the goal shooter who will attempt a shot. And she misses. Contact on the goal defense. The goal attack will take the attempt. And she scores. Takes the ball. Try to find her win defense. There's a contact on the win attack. Win attack gets the ball to a center, the center gets it to a goal attack, and the goal attack makes an easy pass to the goal shooter who attempts and she scores. We're down to a few seconds as we view the last few seconds, and there we have it the end of the game. We are waiting for the official score, but from my view, I can see that the score is 22 to Barbados and 13 to St. Vincent. Legend Baby Gems are currently playing against Grenada. 
All know the basketball where Burger King Clapham Bulls have booked their spot in the finals of the co-operators General Insurance BNBA Premier League. Last night at the Wildy Gym, the Bulls swept their series 2-0 with Fashion Boutique Station Hill Cavaliers by winning game 2, 77-62. For Bulls, Raheem Gibbons had a game-high 23 points. Kimar Ben added a double-double of 20 points and 11 boards. Akeem Marsh had 14 points and Simeon Maynard 11. For the Cavs, Darren Hunt scored 16, Devron Knight 14 points and 12 rebounds, and Brandon Rook 13 points. Bulls, though, will have to wait to find out who their opponents will be in the final, as there will be a decisive Game 3 in the other playoff series between defending champions Pinelands and CAM Smart Assurance City United Celtics. Celtics defeated the Pine 72-66 to even the series at 1-all. Rashid Maynard picked up from where he left off in game one, sizing up any defender one-on-one -on -one and taking it strong to the hole. That was two of his team-high 19 points. But Celtics, as in game one, would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the defending champs. Anan Joseph Thorne also liked to take his defender up one-on-one, -on -one, and here he finishes with the left-hand floater. Two of his 15, as the Celtics were up 34-30 at the half, Switching ends didn't lessen any of the intensity. Theo Greenwich also showing his individual talent, weaving his way to the basket. He had a game high 20. Darian Hurley's game has been off, but he's getting back there. He had a double-double, 10 boards and 13 points. Here with a corner three, as the Pine led 52 to 48 after three. Also with a double-double, but for Celtics, was Joel Hunt. If there's no boxing out, he's out jumping everyone, which earned him 14 rebounds. And this twisting drive was two of his 13 points. Jeremy Gill is another player whose offense is coming back for the pine. He was sent to the free throw line a game high nine times, scoring seven of them. Plus moves like this one gave him 15 points overall. Celtics were determined though. After all, lose and their season is over. Greenwich was having none of that. Head down and once he got past the first two defenders, no one collapsed on him. So it was a clear path to the hole. Dying seconds now and Celtics were up by six. So all that was needed was to keep the ball out of Pineland's hands. And that they did. Celtics winning 72-66 to to force a decisive game three on Sunday at BCC Gym. The winners will book a finals date with the Bulls starting week after. The Business Report is brought to you with the kind compliments of the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Well, in business tonight, several development projects are ongoing to improve the island's food security. And many of them are being done with assistance from international agencies. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Security, Indar Ware, explained the importance of these collaborative efforts at a meeting with officials from the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. Trevor Thorpe reports. The meeting was held to discuss some of the ongoing work between the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture and the Ministry of Agriculture. Minister Indarware says is also an information sharing exercise to make the public aware of what's happening in agriculture. If we are doing the work and they're not being told, we can't blame them for criticizing. So I really appreciate all of this and I wish to give you my assurance that I will continue to work with ECO to keep the sector going forward and to bring along all Barbadians. Head of the AICA delegation in Barbados, Alistair Glean, provided an update on the plans for this year. We have been working with your ministry, as you know, to establish an innovation center for agriculture. We would have supplied some equipment. It is based at the Home Agriculture Station. And at AgroFest, we would have highlighted some of the equipment that's out there, the farm bot and use of drones and ocular sets to highlight the opportunities in agriculture, how technology can play a role in boosting production here in Barbados. And we want to continue doing that going forward, having schools and interested persons go to the home station to see what's possible with technology and innovation. We've also been working a lot with urban gardening to recognize that all hands need to be on deck if we are to talk about food security. The AICA official says they have been training local farmers to assist in the food security effort. 
fish production, vegetable crop production in the units. So that's something we want to promote. And also we've been training master gardeners, as we call them, to go out there and support gardening in the various communities. And we want to continue doing this sort of work. We've been doing a lot of work, which I know the public is probably aware of, in terms of papaya production. We want to boost papaya production in the country. We want to resuscitate the industry and primarily to look at import substitution. Developments in fisheries were also discussed, as well as youth and women in agriculture. Trevor Thor, CBC News. The business sector stands to benefit from a technology security workshop to be held in Barbados later this year. Word of this came from Alterna Tech Solutions architect Fidel DeFort. He was giving a review of a similar workshop recently held at the Garfield Sobers Gymnasium. Today we are faced with growing cyber threats and foremost in our goals and strategies is the responsibility for securing and protecting the data and infrastructure and users. In Barbados in particular, it's not just the businesses. With this thriving tourism industry, we need to reduce the risk to this data, preserve customer trust, reduce business interruption and avoid damage to our reputation due to these data breaches and downtime. Let's get back to sports. Let's get back to Mark. Mark. Again, more than 100 athletes are set to compete tomorrow in the Barbados Amateur Gymnastics Association's Invitational Trident Classic. Ahead of the event, CBC's Admar Goodrich Boys visited the Flip Gym, where local participants were gearing up for action. In an effort to bring greater awareness and participation to the sport on the island, the Barbados Amateur Gymnastics Association is staging the Trident's Classic, an invitational event comprising of over 100 competitors. Assistant Treasurer Charmaine Walcott says teams will be arriving from Jamaica, Antigua and Barbuda, and Trinidad and Tobago. Now we're trying to grow and develop the sport in Barbados right now because it's quite unrecognized, we would say, right now. So we're trying to build that momentum and try to encourage persons to come out and you know participate in gymnastics so we're hoping that this event will encourage them to do so national coach and owner of the flip gym Alison Jackson says she expects good performances oh I think we're gonna do really well the kids have been competing really well so far we've been in Florida and did two meets in Florida some went to another competition in Trinidad um, in March and um, yeah the results have been quite promising and hopefully in front of our home crowd they'll be able to show off their stuff. The event is set to take place on Saturday at the Wildey Gymnasium. And more Goodrich Boys, CBC Sports. Regional under-15 cricket champions Barbados are back on home soil after a plane unbeaten to capture the CWI Rising Stars title in Antigua last week. Again, Anmar Goodrich Boyce was at the Grant Lee Adams International Airport for the team's arrival. It was a hero's welcome fit for champions as the Barbados under-15 cricket team arrived home last night from Antigua to thunderous applause and congratulations. The players and coaching staff who captured the Cricket West Indies on the 15th regional title were greeted just around 10 p.m. by their adoring fans, including family and friends, dressed in national colors and bearing flags and balloons. Winning captain and leading run scorer DeMarco Wiggins, who was elevated to the top of the order, smashed 291 runs at an average of 72.75. He was elated to lead Barbados to victory. Uh, it feels great, man. Uh, all the preparation we had going forward. Uh, just time I said, we just had to execute the plans and we were doing it. I don't think we had any challenges, to be honest. Um, in Barbados here, obviously, we got higher levels than some we played. So uh, I just feel like we just have to stick the plans, stick the basics, be confident, play hard. Really. Head coach Roddy Eswit says it is important to keep this current crop of players together as a unit. I think he's a very, very talented group. He's probably one of the most talented groups I've ever coached. You know, it's unbelievable. But what do we do with them? I, me personally, I would like to keep them together for another six months so they can continue the development. I would also like to see at on the 16 level, they go off to England on a tour because I think it, it's a lot of talent. And more Goodridge Boys, CBC Sports. 
After capturing 37 medals in the pool over the Easter weekend in the Bahamas, Barbados Griffith swimming team returned home last night to little fanfare. Some family and friends gathered at the Grant Tilly Adams International Airport to congratulate the Barbados team, which won 15 gold, 15 silver, and 7 bronze to finish fifth overall on the medal table. Heidi Stout, who etched her name in history by establishing four new crifter records, told CBC Sports she is elated with her individual performance. I'm very happy with my performance to bring home these medals for Barbados, not just for myself. Um, I would like to thank everybody who was involved in getting us there and also at Crifter. I really do appreciate it and I think the whole team does. 13 to 14 age group winner Jaya Simmons was also over the moon after winning 12 medals, inclusive of seven gold. It's a good feeling um, putting in the amount of work that I have over the course of however many months and being able to like get results is definitely a good feeling and I'm very proud of myself. How was the competition over there for you? Um, it's fun and I'm glad that I can be exposed to international um, competition. Um, everybody over there is very good and it was definitely fun. And that's our time tonight. Thank you for spending it with us. I'm Pearson Bowen. For the crew, to all of you, good night. By God's will, we'll see you tomorrow.